Hello, and welcome to the Homeschooling and Loving It podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, your friend at homeschool.com and homeschool mom of six. Join us as we keep it real and chat about the ups and downs of this amazing adventure we call the homeschool life. So grab a cup of your warm favorite and a comfy chair and let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to homeschool.com's Homeschooling and Loving It podcast. Today, we are in episode 42, and we're talking about dual enrollment. You know, with the rising cost of college education, it really is becoming increasingly important for families to find alternatives for preparing their teens for the future. I know I'm one of them. <laughs> so here today to talk with us about how dual enrollment can help is Jennifer Cook DeRosa from Homeschooling for College Credit. Hey, Welcome. Jamie. Hi. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. Yes, and we're so excited to hear what you have to say. But before we jump in, I want to kind of talk about you, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> So Jennifer is joining us today from North Carolina, and we're really excited to be talking about this subject matter. First of all, because we've just done a recent merger with homeschool.com and Let's Homeschool High School. And so we really want to give our listeners a good solid base of understanding about homeschooling high school. And so this is where Jennifer comes in. She is an, definitely an expert, we would think, in this area. And after two, two decades in higher education, Jennifer stepped away from college administration and teaching to homeschool her sons and create Homeschooling for College Credit, which is an organization that helps homeschooling families earn college credit in high school. And so we are so happy to have Jennifer with us today. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I started Homeschooling for College Credit in 2012 as a Facebook page, basically. And I was just kind of sharing some of the things that I was doing with my own family and my own kids, but it has grown. And in 2015, we had enough followers of the Facebook page that I actually expanded. And now we have Homeschooling for College Credit groups in each of the 50 states. Plus we have some specialty groups like one for the military families or one for NCAA sports families. And the entire community is run entirely by volunteers. So we have families all across the country that are knowledgeable, that are doing, you know, all kinds of, of college credit programs from credit by exam to dual enrollment and some of the other ones that we can talk about today. And they are doing that with their families and they're sharing their success and they're sharing their tips and their struggles and their, their stories. And so our community is an online support community. It's, it's not a business. It's just an opportunity for families to connect with each other and find out what kinds of resources are available in high school and how that can help you resourcefully plan not only those high school years, but then also for college. So there's a lot of information to know, but it's a lot less daunting when you have a community of people around you that are there to support you and um, to kind of work with you and guide you. Uh, so, so that's our community and that's the community that I run. In 2018, I wrote home, uh, the book, Homeschooling for College Credit, and that guide helps families kind of take all of those little bits and pieces that we get through social media and it puts them into one a to Z resource that gives them the tools, you know, to go all the way through the planning process. And that book is how our website and our communities are funded. So it's really a big labor of love. And there's a lot of us that put in a lot of time because we're all so passionate about this project. You can tell just when you, when you go to your website and you look around, that it's definitely a passion project. So we appreciate that. I was looking at your About Us page and I noticed you had a really interesting kind of journey that brought you to this, this place of homeschooling for college credit. Just so our listeners can kind of get a little bit of that, that perspective, uh, will you share with us how you went through this process? And I know you had done it prior to actually needing it for your, for your own homeschooled children, but 
how you yourself tested out a lot of your theories. Yeah, I mean, it, it was completely on accident. My background is as a professional chef. I actually went to culinary school right after high school. And I started working for Eastern Iowa Community College District. I helped them run the, the first culinary apprenticeship program that was in the state of Iowa. And so part of my role there was advising students. And throughout probably the first, I would say 10 or 12 years, um, I had never encountered anything, you know, that I had read or heard about in relation to any kind of non-traditional college credit. Like it was all pretty straightforward. But I read an interesting book that talked about a non-traditional college credit program called CLEP, C-L-E-P. And that was actually the first time that I had heard about it. Um, and it essentially explained how a person could study independently and then they could take a standardized exam to test out of a college course. So I was completely blown away by this idea because I'm working in a college, I've never heard of this, right? I'm advising students, I had no idea. And so I immediately went to our testing center and I asked my colleague if this was a legitimate thing, like could, could students come in and test out of a class? And she says, yes, it's a legitimate thing. And not only can they do that, but we are a testing center. And I thought, what? We're, we're a testing oh. center? And she says, yes. And the students can test out of up to 75% of their degree using club exams. So I am sitting there completely stunned because I did not learn about alternatives to college credit through my job. I learned about it completely on my own and, and just entirely by accident. Um, so the reason that that was kind of a big find for me had nothing to do with homeschooling. It had nothing to do with my own education, but it was to help the students that were in my program because the students in my program had a hard time completing their general education requirements. So they were also trained to be chefs and they were working and it was hard to find time for them to take English 101 or to take introduction to psychology. I mean, they didn't even really especially want to take these classes, right? They were just kind of required to get the degree. So these are courses that my students could then test out of and earn the, earn the college credit in their own time. So they could study, you know, in their free time and they could, they could take these tests. So this was a really big deal for me at the community college because our graduation rates were so low that I really saw this as an opportunity to help our students graduate. Um, at the same time, my, my son, who was in, I think about seventh grade at that time, um, he was you know, in middle school and I was starting to have a little bit of a panic about him going into high school. And we have four sons, they've all been homeschooled since day one. And I was really starting to get nervous about him approaching high school. Um, I don't know if you experience this with your kids, but you know, I always felt that that elementary school was always such fun in homeschooling and middle school was a little more serious, but I was terrified of high school and I really didn't even know how we were going to navigate the process to get them into college. Like that was so scary to me. Even though I worked in the college system, I just kind of felt like I really wouldn't be qualified to guide them through that process. So it was just kind of on accident that I thought, well, maybe my kids could earn some non-traditional college credit. You know, we could start maybe trying some of that. And so I took a CLEP exam as a test to see, you know, how hard it was, if it was something that my students and my own kids could take. And I ended up passing that first exam. And I do share that story on my page, but um, I just, I got such a kick out of it. Like I just kept taking the exams and eventually I had enough of those exams that I was eligible for an associate's degree. And so that kind of just uh, snowballed into, into a bigger process. And, and I ended up um, going back to school, getting a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. And it, it just kind of really opened a lot of, of doors for me. But I will say that that one CLEP exam literally did change the trajectory of my life because that was when I thought, you know, other parents who are not privy to this kind of like the insider's information, you know, they really 
need to have someone on their side who helps them see that these programs exist, these methods of, you know, kind of earning college credit early exist, and they're not going to get that from the college. So, yes. um, you know, that was, that was kind of what, what I really felt was very important was for me to kind of work for the other team, if you will. Absolutely. And I, I love the fact that you took the test yourself. <laughs> you didn't wait for someone to just tell you about it. You tested it out and you made sure. But that brings us to our topic today, which is how to help our teens understand, you know, there's a lot of nuances and like you mentioned, programs that college don't colleges don't typically tell the students about or perhaps you know, the fact that they're homeschooled students, they have special regulations and things that they have to follow anyway. So can you just really help our listeners understand dual enrollment and how it, how it is a benefit to our teens, just you know, the, the basics of dual enrollment? Yeah, so dual enrollment is one type of college credit that high school students can earn. And when I, when I started talking about CLEP a second ago, you know, that is a, a different kind of college credit. So dual enrollment is not a testing out of a degree. Like sometimes we talk about testing out of a class. Dual enrollment is actually a student who is enrolled in a college, but then they're also getting high school credit from you, the parent, from the, the homeschool administrator. So that's where the dual comes in. So they're getting credit in two places, the first place with the college, the second place with you. So if you have a student who is enrolled in a private or public school, their dual enrollment program is going to work differently. So this, you know, kind of information that we're talking about today is specific for homeschool families because in a homeschool, the parent is the administrator. So the parent gets to decide that these college courses are going to also be worth high school credit. So what you're doing is you're, you're essentially getting two sources of credit with one amount of work. So as an example, if you have a student who's in 12th grade, instead of doing 12th grade language arts at home using your favorite homeschool curriculum that you have been using, you could perhaps take English 101 at the community college. That student is then gonna get English credit through the community college, but then you're going to award high school credit for their 12th grade language arts. So they're, they're only taking one class, but they're getting credit twice. And in many states, dual enrollment is free. And so if you're thinking about, you know, having your student do college prep or honors level courses in 11th or 12th grade, chances are really good that they're gonna be doing work that's very similar in rigor and standard to that of a freshman college course. So you may want to look and see if in your state, if dual enrollment is free or if it's got reduced tuition, because that is pretty common. It's, it's certainly not available everywhere. Um, you can do dual enrollment everywhere, but you may have to pay for it. So that'd be one of the things, you know, to think about as far as the cost goes. Just speaking, um, I know you're in Georgia, I'm here in North Carolina. We both have dual enrollment um, that's free in our states. But there are some states where the student has to pay. So that would be a factor. But if you think about earning college credit in high school and, and why you might even want to do that, almost every type of college credit that you earn, whether it's dual enrollment, whether it's CLEP, advanced placement, or, uh, you know, just there's so many different options that, that you can do. These credits that they earn are going to be much less expensive than what you're going to pay when they go to college. So when you're in high school, then you're thinking of anything that they're doing, you're gonna be saving so much money over what they will pay if they graduate high school and then start taking classes. So it's considerable um, money savings as well as the time savings. So easy to understand, thank you so much. Yeah. I know I've talked to uh, people, usually in the Southeast about the dual enrollment and get a lot of questions and like you said different states have different regulations requiring you know some some cost or some some that are free brings us to our topic today which we want to talk about dual enrollment but a specific aspect of it because at this point in the year we have pretty much passed 
the fall semester. It's wrapping up now. But the spring semester is just around the corner. And from what I understand, if you haven't started dual enrollment for fall semester, you can take advantage of those options for the spring semester. And so if you could take a minute and explain and help our listeners understand how they might be able to do that for spring semester, that would be great. Yeah, and I love that you asked me this question because I never get asked this question. (laughs) So the college works on an academic calendar. So no matter what your homeschool preference is, if you're going to participate in dual enrollment, you're going to probably have to follow the college calendar. So the college calendar starts in the fall, which is August, and then that runs until the end of or the middle of December. And then it begins up again, and they call that the spring semester. And that's going to be January. So we are technically at the halfway point in a college's academic year. Um, And then following the spring semester would be summer. So if you think about the school year in those terms, we're only halfway through. So we still have plenty of time that you could still take courses in the spring and then even in the summer before you have to think about fall again. So Mm -hmm. if you were not sure, like if you are eligible, if your student is eligible for dual enrollment, but you weren't sure and you, you didn't make it in time to get started for the fall semester, you could still potentially enroll for spring semester and and get benefits for spring and summer. So that is not gonna be true for everybody. However, if you you think that you are eligible, or when I say you, I mean your kids, right? You know that? Yes. (laughs) If you think that you're eligible for dual enrollment right now, it's easy to find out. You're gonna go to your college's website and you're simply gonna ask them, if there is a spring start option, yes or no. Because if, if there isn't at your local program, okay, then we're gonna, we're gonna talk about something else you can do. But if it is an option that you could start in the spring, it's gonna be now, okay? So we're in November right now when we're recording this. And registration is gonna be in November and December for almost everyone who's listening. The thing to know is that dual enrollment students are sometimes low man on the totem pole when it comes to registration. So they're gonna let the students who are degree seeking students who are actually you know, high school graduates who are there getting their degree, they're gonna get preference when it comes to registration. And so what that means for, for high school students is if there's a class that doesn't have a lot of slots, you may not get that choice. But if it's a class that there are going to be a lot of slots like English 101, you're probably gonna have no trouble getting into that. So just know that because registration is gonna be happening now for January start, you're gonna wanna call your college or email them and find out what the eligibility requirements are gonna be for your team. Now, this is really important because it's not the same for everybody. The eligibility is gonna vary. Some programs that are operated by the state are gonna have have eligibility requirements that are going to be implemented across the whole state. That's the case here in North Carolina as as an example. If I move to the next county over, my eligibility requirements don't change because it's a state program. Now in other states, let's say Texas for instance, that's going to be managed at the county level or the district level. So when you move across another county, those eligibility requirements are all different. So it's really hard to know unless you specifically find out yourself. And you, if, even if you found out last year, call again, because colleges are constantly changing and updating the eligibility programs. Dual enrollment is getting really popular and there's more and more um, opportunities and things like that. So I just can't encourage you enough to just call and find out for sure what they are. So it could be based on your student's grade level. It's very common for schools to request that your student be in 11th or 12th grade, but there are some states like Florida that allow dual dual enrollment as early as sixth grade. So you really have to find out if there is a grade requirement. Also, there may be an age requirement if there's not a grade requirement. So those are things to ask. You're gonna likely have to provide a transcript and there's information on how to do that on homeschool.com. But if you haven't already prepared a transcript, 
that's easy to do. You can do that in an afternoon. Don't let that stop you from, from moving forward. Some schools will have some kind of a testing requirement. Now, if they have a testing requirement in place that your student has to meet certain minimum scores, they're going to be able to offer that test to your student. So common exams, um, like an AccuPlacer or Compass, those are, are common community college testing placement tests that are administered through the community college. Generally, there is no cost and they can usually do them same day. Other colleges will allow you to use SAT, PSAT, ACT, end of grade tests, you know, other, other brands of testing. And then there's other programs that don't even have testing, like we don't have testing requirements in North Carolina for admission into dual enrollment. So that's, that's something that you would wanna find out. You wanna find out if there's any kind of orientation or application process and what that is. So the biggest step is becoming eligible. Once you've met those eligibility requirements, you've gotten your application and your paperwork in, all of the other semesters are gonna go you know, very smoothly. But when you first start, you do have to kind of get them in the system, right? You wanna think about if there's gonna be a cost, what that cost is. Now, it's true that many states provide free tuition for high school students. That can also be, um, that can be different depending on if your state has different categories. In Ohio, for instance, public school students are allowed a lot more free tuition than homeschool students. So you, again, you have to, to find out exactly what the costs are. It's completely reasonable to ask them in no uncertain terms, what are the costs? What is this going to cost me? Are there fees? Are there books? Are there other costs that I need to know about? And they, they should be able to tell you what those are. Um, and then another just kind of practical thing to think about and something that I shared with you is that you have to think about transportation. We are in the middle of a very demanding dual enrollment schedule for my youngest son and taking him back and forth to campus. I mean, you have to think about that if you're driving them to campus um, and they're going to be physically present versus like online learning, mm -hmm. that can really be demanding, especially if they don't yet have a driver's license. So those are some of the practical things, you know, that you need to consider as far as getting started, in, you know, for this semester coming up. There's a couple other little things that I, that I feel like I want to mention. One of the things that you should consider if you have a very young student who's going to do dual enrollment, if they have the option of doing online or on campus, you may want to consider using online if they have good written, written um, communication skills and if they're good typists. If you have them go on campus, just kind of keep in mind that they're going to be interacting with adults. And so sometimes we talk about mature content in college classes, but it doesn't necessarily have to come from the class. I mean, sometimes it's just maybe an environment that you don't want your kids socializing with 25 year olds, right? So, you know, just kind of keeping in mind that the if they are on campus, they will be interacting with adults. If they're doing online, they won't have that same spontaneous interaction, but they will have to have good typing skills and you know, kind of be tech savvy, if you will. Yes. Um, so that's just something else to kind of think about. I did this with my child, my daughter who was interested in nursing school. And I found the same, exactly what you said, the same process here in Georgia. They used the AccuPlacer to test them because, of course, they were 10th graders when they were uh, applying and hadn't gotten to the SAT or ACT yet. And it was really very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to share with our listeners that even if you do take the AccuPlacer, and I'm, I'm assuming, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if the Compass test is any different, but they allow you several different um, opportunities to take the AccuPlacer if you don't make make the cut, I guess, the, the lowest minimum score with the first time that you take the test. So we actually can, we actually took the AccuPlacer, I think, two times with my son and just once with my daughter. So mm -hmm. depending on the program that you're looking at, depending on the dual enrollment requirements, testing may not be required for all of the courses that you're considering. So for instance, in some programs, the testing, you know, hitting that benchmark of readiness might not be required 
if they're taking career and technical education courses. So for instance, if your student was going to take English 101, they do want to make sure, you know, that your student either has a grade point average that meets the requirement or that there's a testing, you know, benchmark that they've hit, things like that. But if your student is going to take, let's say, welding, that may not be part of the process. And so it's, it's not always, you know, a yes or a no answer. Sometimes there's other programs that you can do. And, you know, one of the things we had mentioned, CLEP, earlier, you know, if you're not sure if your student is academically ready to jump into a dual enrollment class, you can use a program like CLEP because there's literally no risk. So yes. the way that that would work, um, if your student wasn't eligible for dual enrollment or if you weren't sure that you wanted them to do it, you would simply use your favorite homeschool curriculum that you were planning on using this year anyway. And I would choose one of the subjects that they were especially motivated to do well. Maybe it's literature, maybe it's math, maybe it's Spanish, maybe it's history. You know, one of the subjects that, that they really like. And then as they get to the end of their curriculum, you can have them do some test prep and then they can take a CLEP exam. Now there's a program going on Right now, it's through modernstates.org, and that program is amazing because you go through a free prep class, and it, it is literally free, okay? Wow. So this is not, it's not a full curriculum. You're not going to use this instead of your math book, okay? But you can go in, and it's just like any kind of SAT prep or ACT prep. It's just going to give you the highlights, okay? So you go through the prep course. And you take these little quizzes along the way. And if you pass the course, or I should say when you pass the course, they will give you a voucher to pay for your club exam. And they are a nonprofit organization. And so this was part of a grant program that they received. And so modern states started this program and they started handing out these, these waivers for club exams a few years ago. And we kept thinking that they were going to, they said they only had 10,000 of them. And so we've been kind of waiting for them to run out. And every time I've contacted them, they say, well, we've gotten another grant. We've gotten more money. We've gotten more funds. And so this program is still going on right now. So we've had lots of families take, you know, 10 club exams completely for free, no cost at all. And even, even if you have a testing center that charges a fee for just showing up. Sometimes they have a, an administrative fee or, you know, testing center fee. If you take your receipt and snap a picture and you send that to modern states, they will even reimburse you for your testing center fee. So it is literally no risk. There's no consequences if your student fails. The only people who know is you and your student, you know. Um, and so this would be a way for, for students to try earning college credit on their own without the risk of, you know, enrolling in a college program, if, especially if you're not sure. Wow. So I love using CLEP if, if you're not quite sure about their academic readiness, or if you have a younger student um, that maybe doesn't qualify yet for dual enrollment. And, you know, there's, an, there's a lot of other exams besides CLEP that they can use. Advanced placement is another one, but that's a, a little bit um, more complicated because you have to find a high school that's willing to let your student participate. So CLEP really works as far as just pulling the trigger and getting going on that, on that first college credit. And that's such a great opportunity that they can take the test absolutely free. Oh yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> there's literally no hidden, you know, there's no strings attached. It, it really is a free program. Awesome. I'm gonna look into that myself. <laughs> I've got, I've got a young one who, and like you said, I feel like that's a great kind of a first step just to try the waters out, see if it's, you know, a good fit for them, see where they're at academically and if they're uh, prepared and ready to start diving into the CLEP testing or even the dual enrollment. You know, and one of the things that sometimes comes up in our conversations over on Homeschooling for College Credit is is whether or not, you know, they're going to be able to use a certain test at a certain school. You know, none of us has a crystal ball. So when we're talking about students that are, you know, 10th grade, 11th grade, if there is a CLEP exam that matches up with the curriculum that you're already using, like let's say you're studying United States history, okay, there's going to be two exams that they can take. 
it's not hurting them in any way to take these tests. They don't cost anything. You're already doing the course, right? So there is no, there's no reason not to do them. There, those credits, if they pass, will kind of be banked in their account. And if they end up at a college that doesn't give them credit for them, I mean, we're, we're not, we didn't change anything. There was no, there was just no reason not to do it. You know, we were still studying United States history. They studied hard things. They, you know, they, they did something that was really good and there's just no reason not to, not to even try. So my approach is to bring the CLEP exams into your homeschool where they make sense instead of trying to recreate your homeschool around maybe the CLEP policy of one particular college. You know, I don't, I don't believe in chasing that credit because I have watched colleges change their policies every year and the bottom falls out on some people's plans when that happens, you know. So my advice for families is to plan your own homeschool, plan your own classes, plan your own program for your kids and bring college credit into your program instead of, you know, trying to focus on college because that will happen soon enough. And so if it's dual enrollment, if it's CLEP, if it's advanced placement, any of these things that, that we're talking about today and these, these different programs and resources, they're only good if they make sense for your family. You know, awesome. it's, not, it's not something that everybody should go and, and chase. But if you feel like, hey, this is something that might work for us, then I hope that you have the courage to give it a try because um, we have over, I would say over 90% of our families in our Facebook community are earning college credit. Most of them complete almost a year of college credit before their kids go off to college. And so these are, yes, there are some students that are really bright, but these are normal kids. These are average kids that are just like your kids and mine, you know, um, and, and this is something that average people can do. That reminded me of something. My oldest daughter is married, so my son-in-law likes to tell me the story. When he was just out of high school, he was wanting to try to start getting college credit, and so he decided he would go and take the Spanish CLEP test, which his family uh, were missionaries in Honduras for about 15 years. He's actually uh, dual citizenship, so he's partly Honduran and fluent in Spanish. So he just, you know, I'm going to go take it. I'm going to see what I can get. He uh, testing skills that he already had, and he did, and he did quite well. I think he got nine college credit hours out of it, but so those are some things to consider as well. If you're fluent, you're bilingual, um, fluent in another language to attempt those tests as well. You know, the foreign language exams are worth more credit than any of the other subjects. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are early in the high school process, or even if you're middle school, and you're on the fence as to whether or not you want your student to study foreign language, I know a lot of, a lot of states suggest two years of the same language, but not all of them require it. So if you're, if you're undecided as to whether or not you should do foreign, a foreign language, the foreign languages, um, Spanish, German, and French, those three are all available for college credit through CLEP. And those three are um, going to be up to nine credits as far as, you know, what they're worth. So these are nine credits that you could potentially get for no cost at all. Um, and if, like I said, if you have young students, you have plenty of time for them to acquire that fluency. Now, if you have a bilingual family, oh my gosh, that's low hanging fruit. Like they should absolutely go get this because um, there's just no reason not to. Now, if, if you want to do a language that's not Spanish, German, or French, then it takes a little more strategy to try and find an exam that you can test in another language. So you could do advanced placement. Um, we, I know that there's lots of listeners that probably use classical conversations and those guys study Latin, right? right. So Latin is, is an exam available through advanced placement. That's a little bit harder to find, but that is one way to earn college credit. And also Japanese and Chinese are other options. Um, so it doesn't matter if your family is bilingual in terms of whether or not that's considered legitimate they will give you the credit if your student passes the test. 
So your family can speak any language at home and still take these exams. Yeah, take advantage of that, especially if you can do this opportunity through modern states, as you mentioned, where it's free. Yeah, and we don't know how long modern states is, is going to go on, but like, like I've said, every time I've contacted them, they just assure me that they've got more and more funding. And um, so at least for you know, people in this academic year, for sure, consider it. Well, I appreciate you sharing such a wealth of information with us today and making it so easy for us to understand. But before we go, what, do you have any final words of encouragement for our listeners who may be interested in taking this path of dual enrollment or even the club testing? Yes. So the thing to remember, and it's easy to get excited and it's easy to kind of get caught up in it. And one of the things that homeschool communities, including mine, can sometimes do is give you this sense of urgency where you feel like you're already behind, right? That you have all this to, like, oh, I didn't even know and I'm behind. Okay. So here's my one piece of advice. Drop that because if your student earns one college credit in high school, they are ahead. All right. There is no such thing as behind. Most students don't earn college credit until they graduate from high school. So if your student can earn one college credit, that's a win. That is a big win. And so it's not a race to see how much you can get done. It's not a race, you know, to start as early as possible or to try and graduate high school early. I mean, none of those things um, are promoted in our community at all. The idea is to look at what your plan is, see if college credit makes sense in your plan, if it does, it's going to be less expensive than paying for it later. And it's going to be something that, you know, is worth giving a try. So that's my one piece of advice. If your student earns even one college credit, they're ahead. Fit this program to your student and their abilities and what they can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And it was so great to get to finally meet you. And I will include links to your website and the information that you mentioned within the show notes. So we appreciate it. Thanks, Jamie. It's been my pleasure. If you are in need of help homeschooling your high schooler or are just trying to plan for the future, please visit our section on homeschool.com under the Getting Started menu option. How to Homeschool High School. It's down there, down at the bottom of the first drop down menu. It's full of helpful advice and inspiration as well as free books templates, guides, and downloads that will help make your high school adventure as smooth as possible. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in this week. You can find our podcast on our site, homeschool.com, or on iTunes, Stitcher, and even Google Play. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please take a minute to follow our Homeschooling and Loving It podcast series. Every other Thursday, you'll get a new podcast with great information about specific areas of homeschooling and even parenting. Well, until next time, as we homeschool together, I wish you grace and joy, Jamie. Thank you.